So the Richard H. Treehouse Prize at the University of Indiana. Before I introduce David, I'd like to thank Richard Treehouse for his extraordinary vision and dedication to the values embodied in the Richard Treehouse Prize and the Henry Book Reward. Richard, thank you. I'd also like to thank Matt and Joyce Wall for their role in introducing the school to Richard and bringing us together to form a partnership that is now in its 14th year. This collaboration with Richard has brought the leading architects of our time who, with their work, respect and bring the principles of traditional architecture and urbanism into the discussion of how we build and how we, how we live together in this modern world. The prize and award have also provided a forum for these world-renowned practitioners and academics to more effectively engage our students, faculty, and staff. In the audience this afternoon is also Dr. Dick Jackson, our 2015 Henry Hope Reed Award recipient, who has spent much of this week here on campus giving lectures and participating in the wide range of events about the effects of the built environment on health. Finally, before we begin uh, today's lecture, I'd like to pause for a moment to mark Veterans Day. Today we honor all veterans for their devotion to our country. Remember especially the alumni of our school who have used their architectural education in, ser in service of the nation and its own voices. It is now my pleasure to introduce David Schwartz. All of you are familiar with David's work, and I know many of our students have had a chance to visit David's firm in Washington, D.C., and, first, and see firsthand the extraordinary way that David and his firm have succeeded in bringing about a renewed and spirited dialogue about the contemporary condition of architecture and urban. The firm and David have woven traditional principles of modernity to design building types and urban conditions that are characteristic of our times. With a clever use of pragmatic approaches at the scale of urbanism, architecture, and composition, he has demonstrated a commitment to placemaking by restitching the history of a location to its present and future, and thus creating meaning and beauty. David Schwarz excels in buildings that are crafted and built with an economy that is elusive to other architectural firms, irrespective of their philosophical position. His reliance on both contemporary and traditional materials and methods, combined with an ability to understand architectural language, allows him to calibrate the size and scale of buildings with ease. Rather than resisting modern systems to resolve design issues of his buildings, he readily accepts that he needs to use the latest technology to move sports arena roofs, air-conditioned health care facilities, or span distances that are part of the modern world. His place in the traditional architectural revival of the 20th and 21st centuries has been one of quiet confidence and an assurance that practical issues are addressed first. While David has resisted strong ties to various strands of thought or isms, his works prove that good architecture requires common sense, design talent, and knowledge of both history and construction. <coughs> Perhaps more than any other architect, traditional or otherwise, David Schwartz's work succeeds because he has crossed the barriers of ideology that often hold others back. The seeming reluctance to anchor himself to static principles in an age of transient fads is actually a clever ploy that hides a profound set of values that architecture matters, that the core essence of cities and buildings is knowable and reproducible, and that people must be able to access, care about, and live freely in their cities and towns. Cities and their architecture hold the knowledge necessary for humans to achieve their collective and individual aspirations for security, beauty, and serenity which live up their lives. 
David's architecture begins with the functionality and legibility. It transmits beauty to an evocative remembrance of what it means to be in that particular place. David Shores and his office have taken on the big architectural questions of our time, without resorting to extremes, have pointed the way for a future of the city that is grounded on the foundations of knowledge, on the knowledge of the past, and understanding of how people want to work. In an age of polarized views on virtually everything, including architecture, this pragmatic idealism cuts across ideological barriers and makes so and makes the solution for our cities and buildings easier to see. These solutions are no longer mere imaginings. But through, through, through his work, David Schwartz has allowed us to see that in the post-industrial world, we can still value our past as a body of knowledge that can help us understand how to embrace our future. Please join me in welcoming back to Notre Dame, David Cash. <laughs> I always have to listen very carefully when people introduce me um, because I inevitably agree and disagree with parts of it. Um, and there was only one part of Michael's introduction I disagree with um, as a ma factual matter. Um, so a lot of it was opinion, but there's only one thing I, I disagree with as a factual matter. And that is that we have succeeded by um, paying attention to the great architectural questions of our time. Um, actually, the reason we've succeeded is because we've thoroughly ignored them. Um, <laughs> And the, the, the polemics behind architecture, to me, are probably one of the least interesting parts of the practice of architecture today. Um, I think there's plenty of room for good buildings of, of any particular stripe or sort. Um, and if architecture has any great sadness for me today, it is that not enough people focus on the quality of the architecture, they focus on the ism or the idea. And as I say, we've spent a great deal of time ignoring those questions um, and plan to ignore it for the rest of at least the time I'm at the office. Um, I've known I had to give this speech for at least nine months now, um, and I thought about it, and Michael's asked me sporadically what I was going to talk about, and Sean from my office, whose job it is to make sure I do all things that are required vis-a-vis vis 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 Notre Dame, has been asking me about it forever. Um, and it took me a long time to decide what I wanted to talk about. Um, talking in the name of Richard Driehaus is a great responsibility and a great honor, so I had to talk about something that was worthwhile. Um, and talking to a bunch of students is a great responsibility and a great honor. So the two combined were a, a, a tall order and, and a, a something that caused me to do a lot of thinking. Um, for the Driehaus Prize, um, I gave a talk that was about precedent in its place in architecture. Uh, because I think that one of the, the things the Driehaus Prize encouraged us to do is to look at different places as precedent than had been the stock of the 20th century. Um, and the, the question of how we use precedent, what we view as precedent, um, and where we employ precedent in our work, I think is one of the most interesting questions in architecture today. Um, and if you really think about it, the isms are based in, in many precedents. Um, I wanted to give this talk because, and I walked around the fourth year studio today, um, and I was thinking about the talk I was gonna give as I was saying the things I was take, uh, saying to the fourth year students. And I think this talk is entirely appropriate. Um, you know, there are those that would have you believe that their architecture is new and original. Um, the major point of this talk is that there is no architecture that's new and original. Um, and the only question is how good we are at embracing or hiding precedent um, as we go about the practice of architecture. That was supposed to be forward. I thought that is forward. Um, in 1840, uh, Thomas Cole, um, painted this quite marvelous painting, um, which combined many different precedents and talked about what he, the title of the painting is The Architect's Dream. <clears throat> and it talks about an assemblage of uh, uh, buildings, a city, a place, that comes from extraordinarily different precedent and yet uh, combines to create a, a, a unique and beautiful whole. It was interesting to me to walk around the Notre Dame campus today and look at the classical architecture, the empire architecture, the um, Greek revival architecture, and think about how different architectural styles can be weaved together out of good buildings to make good places. Um, what has become precedent today is, is quite different than used to be. And the notion that we can draw, make anything into a building is a very, very recent phenomenon. Um, the um, upper image on the left is from Star Wars. Um, it's the sand crawler. 
Um, the upper image on the right is a Rem Cool House building. Um, and the, the notion that anything become built, can become a building is a, a very new one. Um, So as I say, the, the, this new attitude towards precedent um, is one that's very important in how what we see as architecture today. But my, my role here, um, as hopefully somebody who will impart something new and will you'll carry away some knowledge that you didn't have before I wasted your time for this hour, um, understanding the history of precedent and how architectural precedent is a part of architectural history, I think is critical. Um, if we look at Greek revival architecture, we can see a fairly smooth continuum of, of Greek revival architecture for two and a half uh, millennia. Um, this is a style of architecture that is entirely based on precedent, entirely based on a very firm set of rules, and has produced great buildings for 2,500 years. So the notion that we look backwards to create architecture and have for a long and continuous period of time um, is not a new one. Uh, if we look at the Van Bruegel painting of 1563, there are lots of images of the Tower of Babel I could have chosen. Um, I chose this one because I happen to like the painting. Um, but if we look at the buildings that are created that clearly draw their architectural form and inspiration from the Tower of Babel. Again, this is another train that's been going on, a train in the, in the study of architecture, that's been going on since the Bible, basically. Um, precedent became a new and much more um, um, in innovative thing in, in the beginning of the 19th century. We look differently at things. Um, you know, Saranen would have had you believe that his Dallas airport was new and original. Um, you do some study and you discover it's not. Um, the interesting thing about, about the buildings on this page is each one of the modern architects would have you believe that his building was the first um, or that he invented this out of hall cloth. But we can look to this um, drawing of Eric Mendelssohn to see that this basic idea uh, uh, was generated at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the 1900s. Um, the notion of taking objects from other places and turning them into objects um, really became very, very prominent after World War II. Um, and, you know, the Jetsons uh, created the video phone, um, Dick Tracy created the Apple Watch, um, and Star Trek um, created the Motorola um, StarTech. Um, so at the beginnings of the, at the end of World War II, we started with this notion that you can take from comic books, you can take from other places, and you can begin to generate um, iconic form. Um, from things where normally weren't seen as that. This is true of architecture, too. Um, I find it really hard to believe that the folks at Skidmore, uh, Walter Ness in particular, hadn't been reading his comics 10 years earlier when he decided to design the Air Force Chapel. Um, and what is so interesting is that in the middle of the, uh, of the last century, people started, new became so important that people started to look to places other than buildings for inspiration because they didn't think that most people would understand that it had come from something if it wasn't a building. Um, I want to, for the purposes of this half of the talk, the, the talk is basically divided into um, um, two parts. One is about precedent and how various architects employ it, and the other is about how we have used precedent in our renovation of downtown Fort Worth. Um, because you are architects, I wanted to convince you that what I'm saying is true. Um, and I wanted to show you how this attitude slash approach to architecture can create a vibrant architecture, uh, an architecture firm and show you brief, roughly 30 years worth of work restoring one city. Um, there is one part of, uh, of the, or one strand of architecture that starts about 1900, which I call historicism. And if you look at Penn Station by um, Mead, McKimmon, White, and look at the Baths of Caracalla, and look at the incredible similarities between these two spaces, it's perfectly clear that, that, that the folks at Mead, McKimmon, White 
were really good students of architecture and knew um, what they were looking at and knew where to borrow from. Um, things were not necessarily so literal as this, but again, if we look at Cass Gilbert's Wool Woolworth building and we look at the Elm Cathedral, we can begin to see how architects at the beginning of, of, of the last century really did look to precedent to create very, very wonderful buildings. Um, and this was really true throughout the, the, the um, 20th century. Um, we look at, at, at the Frank Ford submission for the um, Chicago Tribune competition um, and the Temple of Athena Nike. Um, that will appear again in this lecture. Or Michael Graves' um, building for Disney um, and the Erechtheum. Um, these people were honestly quoting history, didn't try and disguise what they were doing, embraced um, their roots and made their roots part of their present and our future. Um, and you'll notice that there's a little symbol in the right-hand corner of the stage, uh, right at the corner of the um, screen. Um, the, um, this one is for people who've run the Driehaus Prize. Um, you'll notice another one as we go down the road for people who've run the Pritzker. Um, and I think it, you'll find it interesting to look at who's run the Driehaus and who's run the Pritzker. And I think you'll find that there's a similarity of, between buildings of each uh, of the groups in which they fall. Um, but going back to um, the Chicago Tower competition in the Temple of Athena Nike, um, Bob Stern's law school for uh, Brooklyn uh, is taking this again. Uh, because one architect chooses to quote or reference a building doesn't mean he's the only one that's going to do it or it's unique. And we don't know whether Bob was looking at the Temple of Athena Nike or whether he was looking at Frank Ford. But they're all both part of the same stream of thought and consciousness, and they both come from the same precedent. So it's interesting to begin to trace how these things go back through the ages and look at our architectural history over millennia and look where people have borrowed from. Um, College Gothic is one of the most interesting places to me to look at this. Um, College Gothic started with the cloisters at churches. Um, churches were the ultimate in education before uh, Cambridge and Oxford. And um, Cambridge, the folks who started, founded Cambridge and Oxford understood that architecture is a marketing tool, that it's actually um, propaganda. Um, and they understood that if they advertised themselves visually as giving the same quality of education as the churches did, they would be associated with higher quality education. Well, we've understood that over the years in uh, Cambridge and Oxford, uh, Yale and the University of Chicago, and, and here at Notre Dame. Uh, the notion of visual association was one that we as architects must embrace. And we must understand that the, the visual choices we make, the stylistic choices we make, have content, subliminal and conscious, and that we must be very deliberate in those choices that we make. Again, um, looking at some of Thomas Beebe's precedent. Um, and you all know this yourselves because you all do this in your work. Um, and I have to admit, we do this in our work. Um, one of my great dreams uh, had to do a building someday somewhere based on the uh, uh, Villa Rotunda. I think anybody who practices architecture has to view the Villa Rotunda as one of the world's greatest buildings. Um, and when we were hired to do this console in Carmel, Indiana, um, it was a four-sided building. I said, oh boy, great, a four-sided building. We do the Villa Rotunda. Um, <coughs> my office thought I was nuts. Um, but we did it and it was a lot of fun. And I think we created a building that on the one hand it is not the Villa Rotunda, but clearly is inspired by it and proudly so. Um, the reference for us is one that we're very pleased with. Then there came a period where people were less willing to admit that they looked at previous architects, um, that they wanted to pretend they were more original than they are. Um, some of these are my good friends, and if they were sitting in the audience, I probably wouldn't word it quite this way, but since they're not, um, I can. Um, you know, we look at, at um, uh, the Temple of Elmham, um, and we look at Park Well. Now, this is, is, is historicism less disguised than might otherwise be, but it's perfectly clear that it's not obvious that we're quoting from Egyptian architect in the Park Well. And by the time we get to Johnson's Wax, um, it's become disguised entirely. But Johnson was a, 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 um, Wright was a very, very well-educated man. And while he denied left and right that anything he did was anything less than entirely original, um, I think we can see here that that really isn't true. Um, Paul Rudolph was another one of those people who said that everything he did was entirely original and uh, uh, <coughs> nothing like it had been done before. Um, unfortunately for Paul, I worked for him for a while. Uh, and in working for him, I put my last job for Rudolph was to put together an exhibit of his work. And as a result, I got to analyze his buildings far more closely than most. Um, and you can see that the um, Yale School of Architecture building is heavily based on the Larkin building. 
And likewise, the house he designed for Sid and Ann Bass in Fort Worth, Texas, has a remarkable, remarkable resemblance to falling water. Um, these are, are, are um, both projects that are in, all of the images I'm showing you from Rudolph are from, both images are from Rudolph's archive. Uh, so he was well aware of what he was doing. Um, likewise, when Cesar Pelle designed National Airport, you know he'd been to the, the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in Paris. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with these quotes, and actually I think they're great. And I think if we've seen a great space, there's no problem with borrowing it. Um, when we did the ballpark in Arlington for the Texas Rangers, we were trying to figure out a space that was in any way reminiscent to the outdoor uh, concourses in a ballpark. Try to think about it. What spaces are as big as they are? We finally came up with the main apse at Shark Cathedral. Um, so all of our concourses are based as on the dimensions of the main apse at Shark Cathedral. Worked there, figured we might as well do it again. Um, but m m much of, uh, uh, of what happened in the middle of the last century really was taking things out of context and taking things that most people hadn't seen the first version of, stylistically changing it, and calling it new and calling it architecture. Um, I think the, the Renzo and Piano and, and, and Richard Rogers were more honest with Pompidou because I think they admitted that it looked like the um, outside of an oil refinery. Um, but it does look, it looks like the outside of an oil refinery. Um, now there's a real question in my mind as to whether the outside of an oil refinery belongs in that part of Paris. Um, I would maintain that it doesn't. Um, I think this building would be beautiful in a wheat field somewhere in Kansas. Uh, but to me, it's not a building that was meant for that part of Kansas. I mean, that part of, of Paris. Um, and to me, what's most interesting is, is what I call ahistoricism. Um, it's the um, sand crawler from Star Wars. And if you start looking at, at, at people's buildings and you start really looking for what probably inspired them, you find some very interesting things. Um, the slide on the left is a World War II pillbox bunker. Um, the slide on the right is the Hirshhorn. Is it's, it's on the... Uh, um, mall in Washington. Um, Philip Johnson did admit that this building was based on a post office, so he didn't try and hide it, post box. Um, but I think you really can ask yourself the question, does a post office, post box, belong being a skyscraper in downtown Denver? Um, I have serious questions about it. And likewise, you know, Philip was the master of these things, and again, proudly said that the AT, what was the AT&T building was based on a Chippendale grandfather clock. Um, it is it is interesting to see how these forms become buildings, but I think we have to ask ourselves whether this is the way we want to make our buildings, and whether we want to make, base our buildings on things that were never meant to be buildings. Um, again, I.M. Pei admits that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is based on a forty-five record changer, um, and you know, there's a, a guy in my office, one of my partners, who says. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is when you hire an octogenarian um, uh, who was born in China to design a building that should have been designed by a 20-year-old from Los Angeles. Um, and I think there is some truth to that. Um, so, uh, but again, um, I really wonder, I, I, I resent this building even more because the museum is actually in the basement. Every object worthwhile in this building is not, not in that building you see. That building you see is just a very glorified front door. Um, but. We go a little further, and and, and we find a, a kind of tra transition from object to building that does make for a very original building, but it's not a very original piece of art. Um, and I, I really strongly maintain that there is nothing new. The question is how thoroughly have we have researched other people's precedent and whether we understand what they look at at a daily basis. And I think nine times out of ten, the answer is no. Um, now, does a Panasonic radio um, need to become a, a conference, a convention center by Ram Coolhouse? Can it become a convention center? Um, I maintain again, this is a very, very odd um, way to make a building. Um, should a vase uh, be a library? Um, and again, I would say I don't see the rationale here. We, we come to an even stranger moment. Um, when, when moments from movies become buildings. Um, and, you know, this building is called the Friend and Ginger Building. The first person to call it that was actually Frank Gehry. Um, so in doing so, we don't uh, in any way say anything that should upset Frank because he was the first. But likewise, as, as you saw on your poster, 
Um, I don't know that the, the Reb Cool House building here is particularly original. It, you know, I think Steven, not Steven Spielberg, George Lucas deserves the credit um, for having designed this building, um, <coughs> uh, not Reb Cool House. Um, and Star Wars has produced lots of architecture. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is really one of the, the great sources of inspiration uh, for architecture of the latter half of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, and I don't think one can dismiss um, these um, correlations. I don't think one can say um, this is made out of whole cloth. Um, and actually, when um, uh, I.M. Pei was designing uh, the Symphony Hall in Dallas, um, everybody called his four-stage reflector um, the, the start, um, start ship enterprise. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I like doing concert halls. We do lots of them. And I've, I've been astounded by this image since the first time I walked into the building. Um, I think there are lots of ways to, to, to make a concert hall, but putting a spaceship in the middle of it is not one of my preferred ways of doing so. Um, this is one of my favorite images. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I actually have seen this building, and I can't say that Liebskin actually was thinking this when he designed this building, but it is absolutely what I thought the first time I saw the building. Um, I was in Toronto, minding my own business, walking down the street, and I saw this, and I said, my God, this looks like a shark eating a building. Um, and I mean, the lack of respect for architecture, the lack of respect for environment, the lack of respect for the street. Um, to me, and in, in, in this is just stunning. And as I say, I can't say that Liebschitz actually was thinking of the movie Jaws, but it sure does look like it to me. But if we go to, to some of the other um, things, places we can look, and look at the inspiration that people get from movies, the inspiration people get from cartoons, I think one of the, the real questions that we as architects and we as practitioners really need to ask ourselves is what we want to use for precedent. Um, and the great difference between... Um, the people in this room and many people studying architecture other places is that you will choose different things for precedent. The, the, there is also a question that what you choose your precedent, how well you execute it. But that's a very different issue. If you choose a bad precedent, it's going to be a bad building regardless of how well you execute it. Um, and, you know, th this notion of the Jetsons um, are another great originator of architectural form. Um, and if you watch the Jetsons and then you drive around Southern California amongst other places, um, you find lots of things that were clearly um, um, out of that, that period of cartoons. Um, I have another section of this lecture when I deliver it in its entirety that looks at the Blobists and the Flintstones. Um, and um, I, I do think it, it's enormously important to, uh, to place ourselves and understand that we all exist within the realm of precedent. We all exist within the continuum of design and we all exist choosing what parts of, of our built world we want to celebrate and respect. Um, and I think it's extremely important that we, 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 we not buy um, the garbage that some modernists sell us. As I say, I'm not a stylist. I really am not. Um, I don't have any particular um, beef for one style or another. Good building's a good building. Um, but I do have problems with buildings that are built out of pieces of Swiss cheese or bedpans. Um, I don't think this is really where we want to look for the forms we choose to celebrate and embrace. So our firm has decided that the future really comes from looking backwards and that bringing the past into the future. Um, one of our clients says that our work, my firm's work, um, is what would have happened in architecture had the period called modern architecture never happened. Um, and if you stopped somewhere in the beginning of the 1900s, wiped out everything from 1930, 40, somewhere around there on, and put us into it, we would be the natural continuum of architectural style. And I don't have a problem with that. I, I think we do very much um, try and, and look to the architectural continuum and place ourselves within it and expand it and extend it. Now, I have to admit, we're not above taking our precedent from movies either. Um, and um, we did, and Sean worked on this project, and we were working on it. You know, we thought about what is the paradigmatic town hall? Well, it's in Back to the Future. Um, and, and if you want to come up with something that is parent, for us, that was just the greatest example of a town hall. And I'm, I, I don't mind admitting that we did 
look at that movie very clear, carefully when we designed the building. And it worked so well when we did it the first time, we thought we'd do it a second time. Uh, so we're not above looking at modern cultural references for our precedent. Um, we generally tend to use buildings um, rather than pieces of Swiss cheese. Um, the, it is this that attitude towards architecture um, that with which we came to Fort Worth. Um, this year we've been working in Fort Worth for 30 years. Um, we have spent um, just shy of $3 billion um, in downtown Fort Worth in, in, in those three years, or in Fort Worth. Um, we have had a unique opportunity um, to work with a group of committed citizens and committed clients and a committed government to rebuild the city. Um, when we arrived in Fort Worth, everything you see in yellow was a vacant lot, a parking lot. Um, it was a moribund city, but not quite dead. Um, the Fort Worth's history um, was an interesting one. It started as a cattle town um, and was quite successful as a cattle town. It was a lovely small town. Um, and it really was a town filled with cowboys. It was titled Where the Wisp Begins. And, and then something happened in Fort Worth that happens lots of places. They found oil. And just like finding oil has done for many other countries, Venezuela is a prime example, um, unlimited wealth creates unlimited success. Um, and Fort Worth boomed. Um, it built big buildings, it built nice buildings, um, it adopted the automobile, they paved their streets, um, they built um, very expensive, very beautiful buildings, they grew, they prospered, um, they did wonderful things, they had movie theaters, they had cultural centers, they had everything. Um, but then after World War II, uh, Congress passed something called the, uh, the GI Bill. And what the GI Bill did was it let returning GIs buy a house. And by house, they meant a single family freestanding thing. Couldn't be an apartment, couldn't be attached, couldn't be a townhouse. It had to be a single family freestanding thing. Um, there is a, a much record of the fact that there was a great deal of lobbying by the automobile industry on the on this fact. Andres Dewani gives a much better lecture on this than I ever will. So if you want to know more about this, call him, not me. Um, but the result of, of this was that in 1956, uh, Fort Worth uh, commissioned Walter Gruen to create the Greater Fort Worth Master Plan. The idea was tear the city down, um, build parking lots at the edges of it, make the whole interior of the city pedestrian, um, and start over. And Fort Worth blindly followed. This was the wisdom of the day. They blew up the downtown, quite literally, or the bulk of it. Um, and this, the, play, the city became one of parking lots. Um, hence the drawing you saw with those eleven, with those yellow blocks. Um, it got to the point that Fort, Fort Worth was just a slum. Um, there was nothing there you wanted to see. There were stripper clubs. Um, there were boarded up buildings. It was really um, just on the edge of death. Um, the only um, human-like thing you saw on the street um, was fire hydrants painted as people um, so that you get some feeling of life. When, when we arrived in Fort Worth, the great complaint in Fort Worth was that you could shoot a cannon down the street and you wouldn't kill anybody at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and that was, in fact, true. Um, the first step to rebuilding Fort Worth was before our tenure there and was a Main Street revitalization program um, in which the federal government gave Fort Worth the city to make their main street out of bricks. Um, it did begin to make a difference. You can see these before and after shots of um, what buildings were uh, when we arrived and how they were renovated in the very early 80s. Um, and these are before and after shots left and right, um, as are these. So Fort Worth began to get its act together. Um, in the Fort Worth Renaissance, they made a mistake that many cities do, which was to believe that building skyscrapers was the answer to the problem. Um, you know, every great city has great skyscrapers. Um, um, I don't think that's the fact. I mean, one of the things that makes Paris so wonderful is that there are no skyscrapers. Um, and what what's makes cities work is density. Um, skyscrapers are one way of creating density, and urban, um, a unified urban height is another. Um, Paris and Washington choose one. Um, New York and Fort Worth chose another. Um, and a lot of them, unhappily, are really uninteresting. Whoops. Skyscrapers. This is the point that we were hired. Um, and um, we were hired to do a new master plan for downtown Fort Worth. Um, and we were hired mostly by downtown Fort Worth, Inc., which is private money, 
and a little bit by the city. So the, the city was interested and watched, but not a major participant. Um, the slide on the top left is that slide of parking lots again. The slide on the top right is um, um, unfriendly edges, which were either parking lots can, um, or um, boarded up buildings or something you didn't want to walk next to. Slide on the left were um, streets that uh, were interrupted by combined uh, um, blocks. This slide on the lower right is blocks that were ended by um, spanning bridges. And we took all of these and looked at them, overlaid them all over one another, and identified what we considered the, the core of downtown, um, which was this. Um, and we have spent the past 30 years um, trying to rebuild this urban core. Um, this is the order of some of what we've built. Um, now I'm gonna show you a good bit of what we've built, though not all of it, um, and show you the precedent for those buildings. Um, this is another part of our master plan. This was Fort Worth when we arrived. Um, and you'll see Fort Worth when, where we are now at some point in this. But the first uh, major project we built was um, Sundance Square, major downtown apartment building. Um, also has movie theaters in it. Um, and you could see that um, the precedent's not hard to find for, for our apartment building at Sundance Square. But we were very concerned with knitting the city back together again and building a, a texture that made Fort Worth a place that had been around for a while rather than something that had been torn down and rebuilt. A part of that project was also a cinema project um, and which we wanted to, well, we had to build a multiplex. We wanted to um, hark back to the days when movie theaters were actually movie theaters. Um, and again, looking at where we drew precedent to design our movie theater. On the downtown Fort Worth Public Library, um, uh, Fort Worth was lucky enough to be one of the, the 13 first places to get to, a place to get one of the first 13 Carnegie Libraries. All of the 13 Conway libraries were neoclassical. Um, and our belief was that the person that really ought to be honored in the building of the library was Carnegie for establishing the library system in the United States. Hence, we chose to build a neoclassical building. Um, and this is the original Fort Worth uh, Public Library, um, which seemed to us to be the appropriate place to look to as precedent to build our new library. Uh, Bass Hall. Uh, probably the, the building that really put my firm on the map. It's either this building or the ballpark in Arlington. It's a hard choice as to which. Um, Bess Hall is a very small building on a very small block. Um, and it is true that you don't see a lot of buildings with 49 foot angels that weigh two tons a piece on them. This is not something you find in buildings around the world. But the forms of, of, of a concert hall and the kinds of buildings we look to are in quoting do go um, back throughout um, the history of performance halls. And for us, we, we consider ourselves to be um, contextual architects. So context for us is both a question of the physical urban context or non-urban context is what you find yourself, as well as the context of what the building's used for. Um, and the context for musical performance is one that goes back probably to um, uh, Vincenza and uh, on the um, Teatro Olimpico, um, and so we believed it is worth paying attention to that precedent. Um, we had to build a little rehearsal hall next door to that. Um, so we decided we would look for a nice jewel box little building, which um, there are lots of around here, um, to use as our, our precedent for that, that small rehearsal hall building. Um, likewise, the other rehearsal hall building, um, the building we chose as a precedent there is actually in Fort Worth. Uh, it's called the Western Union Building. Um, but again, our buildings don't ape history. They simply respect and reflect it. Um, and that's very much what we try and do with our work. And that is to create a continuous sense of continuity um, in the places in which we work. Uh, this is an office building in downtown Fort Worth. Again, um, we believe that the Chicago style um, building of the early 1900s is a, a fine place to look for precedent for that. Um, this is a building that we finished at Tarrant County Law Center um, and uh, again, we tried to take a what is a very traditional um, court form uh, and, and make it something that was current, um, comprehensible, um, and beautiful. Um, the If you look at most courts buildings around this country at this point, they're <coughs> really quite unfortunate. Um, this was a family courts building, and family courts are all about children. Um, and to create a, a building that children could understand deal with and not frighten them was a critical part of our work here. Um, <laughs> I love this slide. Um, 
we were also hired to do a jail in Fort Worth. Um, there are lots of people who have designed jails. We actually, uh, 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 me, becoming White, designed a jail, and H.H. H. Richardson designed a jail. And I decided that if it was good enough for me, McKimmon White, and H.H. H. Richard to have in their body of work, we certainly needed one too. Um, everybody in Fort Worth was amazed when we went after doing the jail. Um, the slide, the building behind ours um, is the jail that was built before ours. Um, and the, the notion that you could design a jail for, an, this is downtown Fort Worth. Um, so it seemed to us, if you're going to build a jail in downtown Fort Worth, you, your greater responsibility to the people is to the people who are not in jail rather than the people who are in jail. Uh, so it seems to me that to ignore the people who are not in jail, who have led good lives and make their lives much worse by taking care of the people who are in jail it seemed extremely perverse to me. Um, but the, the, the notion of creating prisons that can work in a downtown environment is not a new one. Uh, and so as I said, I was very, very interested in doing this and, and really wanted to do this commission. I think my office was a bit surprised, but the town of Fort Worth was amazed. Um, this is a building we just finished. It's called the Trust. Um, it is an office building. You can see on the top of it, there, we built a little bit of residential on the top of both these buildings. Um, again, it's a building whose precedent is easy to find. Um, but again, if you look at our building, it's clearly not a building that was built a century ago. It's clearly a building of today. Um, one of the great things that, that um, we were able to do in Fort Worth and what is the what we consider to be the, um, I would say, not the completion, but really, yeah, the completion of the first phase of our work in Fort Worth was to build a new town, a town square. Uh, we had been building around um, these two blocks for, I guess when I started to do this, was 25 years. Um, Ed Bass is somewhat older than I am, who was our client for this project. I think I was 58. 57 when I went to talk to him and I said, Ed, I'm getting old um, and you're older than I am. So that means you're getting older. Um, and we have a responsibility to Fort Worth to finish this before we um, hand in our di dinner pails. Um, we've done so much work here and so much money. We, we've got to build this project. I took six months to think about it. And he finally said, yes. Um, the, there's a pavilion in it that is um, really a community pavilion that's used for lots of things. Um, it's based on the Palm House um, at the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Um, you can find equally good precedent at Kew Gardens um, in, in London. Um, the Commerce Building, uh, which sits on the east side of the square, uh, is a building based on a building that we see in, in, in Washington a lot, which is uh, uh, down near the mall. Uh, it's a wonderful building. Um, as you can see, our rendition of it is not historic. As very much of our time, but by looking at precedent, looking at how you make good buildings, we learned a lot about how to make ours. Um, another part of that development was something called the Westbrook. Um, it was um, uh, finished at the same time, and based on on, on various Art Deco um, structures across the country, there's a lot of very good deco in Fort Worth. So the precedent for both of these two buildings, Fort Worth is very much a brick town. So while the actual buildings we looked at came from a, diver a diversity of places. The styles we chose are quite indigenous to Fort Worth, um, with one exception, um, and that would be our plaza. Uh, this is a, a, a large plaza. It is now the center of downtown. Um, it is the 100% corner. It's, it, we closed Main Street to build this, um, and so you now travel around the square rather than through it. Um, it is the, which is a very much a Texas gesture. But um, our inspiration for this, um, um, came from, from a lot of different places. Um, the umbrellas um, from a place in Saudi Arabia. Um, Fort Worth and Saudi Arabia have a very similar problem in that it's hot. Um, and the great pace problem with the creation of public space in Fort Worth is you want people to use it when it's hot. These umbrellas are marvelous things. Um, they come up and they go down and everybody comes to watch them go up and go down because uh, it, it's quite a performance. But they can go down, they can come up. So we provide shade with the umbrellas. Um, we provide coolness with the fountains, which I you see better here. Um, kids come and play, and it's really, um, really activated downtown Fort Worth. It's interesting because many of our clients have owned the real estate around us, and they have percentage rents. And so we, were, we know what happened to the businesses around this square. The, literally, the day this square opened, their, 20, their um, percentage rents went up by 25%. Um, and that is the least they have gone up on a day-for-day -day match over the past year. Sometimes they've gone up as much as 50% on, on an equal day. Um, 
But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you take these lessons, you can learn about precedent. If you study the world well and you bring them to bear on a place, you can make a huge difference to that place. And the reason for, for, for showing you Fort Worth and showing you this um, uh, particular set of images is to begin to help you understand that what you are learning here and the um, exercise of looking at precedent and figuring how to use precedent in your work is a really critical one. And I think one of the great things about Notre Dame is it doesn't suggest you look at Swiss pieces of Swiss cheese to know how to design your buildings. Um, and I think really the, the question as you go through here and you emerge from here is what part of history are you interested in bringing into the future? What part of the body of Western culture resonates with you? How does that culture form the future of our culture? And I think really that the, 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 the major questions facing architects today are not stylistic ones. They are questions of how we play um, in, in the continuum of 2,500 years worth of architecture. You have the choice of, of, of building um, um, buildings based on Swiss cheese or bedpans. Um, uh, Washington is in the middle of opening a building and opening a museum that's based on an African hat. Um, David Ajay designed it. He's a lovely man. I think the world of David. Um, and in his presentation on that building, he will show you the hat. He will show you the building um, proudly. Uh, it's actually not a hat. It's a crown. I'm underselling it. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the great freedom we have is where to choose our inspiration. So what I wanted to bring to this, this conversation, um, this lecture, if you will, is this notion that precedent can justify any building. And because people tease you for looking at a classical building, you can tease them for looking at a piece of Swiss cheese. Um, I would rather look at a building than a piece of Swiss cheese. But I don't think that the argument can be made that we're leading people into the future, and that's why we design the way we do. I don't think the argument can be made that you're looking backwards to history, and I'm, not, and I'm doing something that's entirely original. And I think one of the great things that bothers I don't dislike modern buildings. I, I was talking to the uh, gentleman who runs your art gallery earlier today, and we were talking about the Nasher, which is a, an art gallery in Dallas, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful buildings built in the recent past. Very modern building, excellently designed building. The question isn't um, a stylistic one. The question is one of quality. Do we build buildings that are good buildings, excellent buildings, well-considered buildings? And if we are going to build buildings that are good buildings and well-considered buildings, where do we draw the ideas on which we base those buildings. Um, this slide, that my closing slide, um, will show, shows you Fort Worth when we started in Fort Worth where it stands today. Um, we've built an awful lot down there. This is not everything we've built in Metroplex. This is just downtown Fort Worth. Um, we are currently working on two more projects in Fort Worth. Um, and I suspect we'll be working in Fort Worth until, well, certainly until me and our main client die, but I suspect it'll be somewhere after that as well. Um, but my, my point here is you're, you're, you're and I don't mean this as a pun, uh, but you really are doing God's work because the question in architecture is what ideas are durable, what ideas last, what ideas are worth celebrating? And it is you who will carry that choice into the future. And that's a great responsibility. Thank you. I'll do whatever you want. Is that what you wanted? That's easy. <laughs> ah, I knew I was going to get off that easy. Something was not going to be so shy. I always try not to do the first one. <laughs> no reason not to. No reason not to. Uh, so one of the early points that you made was, and I'm quoting, there's nothing new. I think that begs a few questions, and I'll try to be nice and ask one or two. Oh, no, don't, don't be nice, please. Don't no, I had to be nice. You don't have to be nice. When you get to my age, you're supposed to have learned to be polite and have manners. First, when do you think that started? Why did it start? And third, I'm not particularly sure that it's true. You mentioned this last one. Uh, the building in D.C. where the man's designing it based on the Nazi crown. Right. Well, we could say 
that in High Renaissance, after Bramante comes around, Raphael, when they're really bringing things back, they really understand it, and they're putting some things in new. That well, where are we going after that? And then we have Michelangelo, and then he designs the new sacristy. And if you look at a lot of his precedent, his drawings that didn't get built, while well, Ackerman describes it, the top of it is based on a craft. But it's um, fantastic. It's beautiful. It is new. Oh, and it's using the things that were already there in different ways. So I wonder. No, ask your questions one at a time. First one. <laughs> I don't have that good a memory. That's the advantage of being my age versus yours. When do you think it started? Um, I think, and it's an odd um, con con confluence of stuff, that the fascination of becoming of the new and the cult of personality started sometime in the interwar period. And I think they really go together. Um, I think that, you know, the fact that Paris Hilton can exist in our world and with absolutely zero credentials and the fact that we can make buildings out of pieces of Swiss cheese are highly related. Because I, I think that somewhere in the interwar period, we became so lazy that we um, um, didn't care about substance anymore. And we became much more concerned with style and newness than substance. Why? And why do you say then? Because I could say that the cult of personality then would be in a way separate from the laziness, because then we also have Michael, and I'm, I'm Michael Angel's my favorite, so I'll just go there, who says, I'm not here to be a copyist. And then Bramante says this, the exact same thing. And takes well, no, let, 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 let's stay in one place for a time. You, we, <laughs> uh, I'm happy to go back after we've dealt with the, the, the just, just stop after then, go back to your, your question about the present. When and why, or what was the? Well, you said what? Yeah. Why do you think then? Why do you think it happened then? Um, what about then made it then? I'm going to borrow from Charlie Moore and Vince Scully here. Um, one of the, the, the great moments of my life when I was at school, I took an independent study course with Charlie Moore and Vince Scully. Um, the, the, the thesis was, um, how do you teach architecture? Because I think it's a very difficult question. It was the best course I ever took, because all I do was listen there for three hours a week and argue with each other. Uh, it was it was my favorite course, but what they would both answer for you um, is it, is with the advent of mass media, that as soon as information became quickly di um, disseminable, and you could give vast quantities of people vast quantities of information very quickly, people began to become lazy. And if you want to, and this is a terrible thing to say to your generation, but if you look at the degradation of information or communication as, um, as um, information gets quicker. Um, I know many of my nieces and my nephews tell me that texting is conversation. They believe it. Um, and I do think that as conversation becomes quicker, it becomes much less substantive. I know people who think Facebook's a relationship. Um, I'm willing to say all sorts of things. I know you're gonna boo me at the end of this. Uh, but I, I do think that, 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 that what has changed um, the way we consider as the speed at which we're delivered information. Not as much time to consider. Sure, but I think that's a steady process. Absolutely. Speed, no, 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 it's not, a, no, it's, 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 it's not a steady process. No, it's not a steady process. Um, it's a process that, that, that happens in leaps. Um, the internet changed everything. Um, the mimeograph machine changed everything. The printing press changed everything. Um, and it's like the Industrial Resolution. I mean, 150 years changed the world. Um, we are somewhere after the beginning of the change of, of communications. Um, I don't think we've seen the beginning of it yet. I mean, I, I, I don't think we sitting in this room can talk about how the dissemination of information is gonna change the world over the next 50 years. It's totally unclear. Um, what is publishing? Uh, what is music? Um, or how are, they, uh, how are books um, um, procured? I, I think we're really very much after the beginning of a totally new world in terms of communication. Do I, and I do think that world will have implications on the built environment. Can't tell you what they'll be. So then That's why I have to keep working. Just listed uh, four or so things that have changed everything. The printing press, the industrial revolution, if you go back to the codex from the monasteries that allow you to flip the books and set the scrolls. Then why is it? The 30s, why is it that? 
point of mass communication when there have been. That's what I meant by it was steady. There were other times no, when it's not. It's not steady. Well, well, the reason the thirties um, were actually, I would say, the twenties and the thirties, and the reason I would say that period of time. I think two things happened. One, the war ended. Um, and World War I destroyed society as we know it. And while it didn't, the day the war ended, society wasn't entirely different. You know, I'm sure many of you watched Downton Abbey. Um, it's the story of the change of the world. Um, and, you know, one of the great things about it is that it does deal quite accurately historically with how the world changed at that point. Um, and I think you got a radical expansion as a result of World War I that changed the world one way. Then you had an incredible depression which changed the world another way. Um, and it is the dialogue between those two um, events and those two ways of life and those two economies that yielded, I think, much of the modern movement. So it seems to me that that's different than saying that the issue is the, the cult of the personality because i think you can find that in other points of history maybe not as prominent as society, if, if you yes and if, if you want to pick apart this discussion that way you're you're welcome to but things can happen simultaneously um and i would say that it was the communications that happened during that same period think of rko pictures and what happened to rko during those um 30 years um that uh, the movies have a huge amount to do with the creation of the cult of personality i mean they're one of the largest forces in it and if you wanted to say look at the two milestones of the cult of personality i would say the advent of of, of talkies uh, or, or movies and talkies and the and the advent of television you play another question <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you can talk to me after the lecture we'll chat in the reception I was wondering, uh, when you look at a lot of the contemporary production uh, listed under parametricism, where a lot of the, the design actually is done with computer software, which comes from aeronautical design and some kinds of other sophisticated technology, uh, is, is the fact of precedent relevant in this design? Because sometimes you feel that the design uh, kind of accidental, so they kind of sometimes just look like things you have seen already, but it seems to be more accidental, so it's often in Congress. So people just kind of feed in an algorithm in their computer, and then the, there's a poem coming out, and they make it into architecture. So um, I have two answers to that question. One is that the interaction, the stuff that comes out of a computer, is the interaction between the operator and the software. And um, do I believe that the operator's mind has been affected by what he has seen? Yes. And do I believe uh, that the training of the operator creates interaction between the inter operator and the, uh, and the software? Absolutely. So that would be my first answer. My second answer is just as there is conceptual art, there is kept conceptual architecture. There is architecture that happens by accident, but you can't say that you can rely on its being good. Um, and you can't rely on it. Many wonderful things happen in the world by accident, but many more horrible things in the world happen by accident. You have a question? Oh, come on, Richard. I, 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 should, I should give my special thanks to Richard, who um, um, was, was my co-winner this year. And also, we're coming, the third book on our work is coming out, and Richard and Michael were both kind enough to write pieces for our book, and I, I have to thank them both for uh, taking the time and uh, making the effort to do so. Any other questions? Or, or perhaps Except here, you have to wait for the reception. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Seeing none, we started the drawing room next door. And, uh, and uh, to our reception, and speak to James Lord. Thank you. 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 Thank you.